pray, Lord, open my eyes to see you and see you greater than what I have seen so far in my life and ministry. Open my eyes, Lord. Father, we, we just look up to you this morning. Thank you for you have greater things ahead of us. You have greater things to do in us and through us. Lord, we pray that you open our eyes of understanding to see more than what we have spoken so far. That, Lord, that we will personalize, personalize it and that these things will be true for us, not just on a corporate level, but on an individual level. Thank you for doing this, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. Amen. All right, now, um, let, let me begin again. Like, um, we have heard so far that there are greater things that we shall see. Definitely, without any doubt, that is the will of God for every one of us, that we see beyond what we have seen so far. As far as God is concerned, he's always in the business of doing something better and better and better. It starts with a small thing, and then that small thing begins to grow and become bigger and better and greater. Now, there are three times that you find Jesus speaking about greater things to come in the book of John. The first one is the one that we have focused on the, during the convention. But I need to uh, address your mind to the other two. I think we should read it in succession. Let's begin from the first one. John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1. I'll come back to this chapter, but let's first of all look at the statements, the words of Jesus that he spoke. In the last two verses of chapter 1, Jesus answered and said, verse 50, unto him, that is Nathanael, because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou, thou shalt see greater things than these. So Jesus began at this moment to talk about greater things. And that was a few days after he had an experience. Jesus had an encounter at Jordan. If you go back in chap this chapter, you notice that John began to speak about the Son of God. He said, I would not have known him, but him that sent me to baptize said, whoever you see the Spirit coming upon and resting permanently, that is the Son of God. you find that in the previous verses. That, that should be around 20, 20, between 28 and 20, uh, 25 to 29, if you read that, those verses. So there's a reason why Jesus began to speak. Jesus was, wasn't just speaking out of, out of uh, you know, presumption. There was something Jesus knew that had happened to him that made him to say that. And I pray that, Lord, that God will give us understanding of what it takes to see greater things and to understand what it is to, to, do, I mean, to look up to, to God for greater things. Now, Jesus said, there, he said since, since I, because I said this and you believe, then you will see greater things. So, which means there was something that was great that Jesus had done as at that time. And what is that great thing? Because if you are going to talk about greater things, you need to talk about what is the great thing and then you move on to the greater. So you, we need to understand what is the great thing that Jesus, you know, was trying to talk about. It, there was a reference point here. There was this word of knowledge that Jesus gave about uh, Nathaniel. He said, I saw you under the fig tree. And he said, behold, an Israelite who is without God. I'm paraphrasing. So Jesus knew Nathanael beyond, beyond the surface. It was like seeing him from the eyes of God. He had, he, he had the eyes of God to see Nathanael, in not just on the outward, but as he was. It's only God that can do that. For man looketh on the outward. Is that, also, is that not what the Bible says? Man looks on the outward, but God looks on the inward. Most times we look on the outward. We, we look at people from the basis of... Uh, what they are on the outside. We are carried away by what we see. It takes God to show you who you are and what people are. 
And to be able to give a word of knowledge like that, I think is outstanding. Not, I've, I've, I've listened to people give word of knowledge, but uh, when they give word of knowledge, you know there is still some ambiguity. You are not sure, you are confused the more, rather than, you know, getting a clear picture of what they are trying to tell you. But when Jesus gave this word of knowledge, it was so superb, so fantastic, deep down, and Nathanael knew that this must be the Son of God. It, it was extraordinary. I want to tell you that, or rather I should ask you this question. What are the great things that you, are, you have experienced so far? Because you have to, we have to start from there first. Whatever great things God has done, your God has used you uh, in life and in ministry to do, there is something you should look ahead of. Because God is always in the business of doing new things. He said, behold, I do a new thing. Shall you not know it? It shall spring forth. God is always in the business of doing something new, something better, something greater. And that's why we cannot afford to just be like a desiccant and sit complacent, being complacent about where we are in the things of the Spirit. We must look ahead. We must, we must know what it takes to see the greater things. Like I said, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. So Jesus said, if I've given this and then you are, you are, you are that dazzled, then <laughs> expect something greater. And of course, we began to see how Jesus began to move in the power of God, in miracles and signs and wonders, and there were greater and greater, greater things that were accomplished through his ministry. I don't want to go into all of that, but look at another place where Jesus again spoke about greater things again. Go to John chapter 5, 19 and 20. 5, 19 and 20. So you can see that Jesus was not complacent. Jesus was always on the, on the move, ready to do as the law we give him permission to do, as God we give him permission to do, and to do much, much greater. So he, he tells, he began to answer the question, he began to speak here again in verse 19. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, that's the Jews, they took him up in the discussion. He said, very, very, I say unto you, the son can do nothing of himself. But what he said the father do? For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the son likewise. For the father loveth the son and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. Now, from what Jesus said here, you can also see here that before you can say you want to do greater things, you must, be, you must have seen it before you can do it. There's a law of the Spirit that you can, you can only have what you can see. You can't, you can't have what you can't see. As far as your eyes can see, so shall you have. God told Abraham, he said, look northward, southward, eastward, westward. As far as you can see, I've given it to you. It's a law of the spirit. As far as you can see, you can have it. When, uh, when Elisha was following Elijah to receive a double portion of unction so that he may do greater works, greater things than he, Elijah, the Bible, the Bible said it was not until when they got over to Jordan, they crossed over to Jordan, that Elijah asked Elisha, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, that may have what? Double portion of your spirit. And then he said, what you're asking for is, is a hard thing. But if you can see it, you will have it. If you can see when I'm taking up in the wild way, then you'll have it. That's the law of the spirit. What you cannot see, you cannot do. What you cannot see, you cannot have. So Jesus said here, yeah, Jesus said, I can of my own self do nothing. I am not the one doing these things. There is a spirit in me. There is a God in me that is at work. And it is what he shows me that I do. I will never do what he would never ask me to do. And that, that's, 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 that's another, another important, very important. I don't want to go into that. A lot of people are doing what God has not shown them to do. They are only showing, doing what, what they see others do and copy. They have become copycats. A lot of ministers are guilty of this. 
And the, on the last day, God will say, I never knew you. You workers of iniquity. It is iniquity to do what God has not commanded or what God has not shown. Another scripture, another scripture. Let's go again. John 14, 14 12. To help you see the scope of these greater things. That the greater things is not limited to Jesus. Because Jesus again, again, began to talk about greater things. And in this, this particular scripture, Jesus began to talk about you and me doing greater works. So which means this principle that we see in the life of Jesus is not only applicable to Jesus alone, but it's for all who believe in Christ Jesus. All those who believe. Hallelujah. John 14, 12. Look, go to that scripture. Alright, it's already there. Very, very I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And what? Greater works. The first day I read this, <laughs> I said, ah, is Jesus trying to cajole us? Am I reading correctly? Am I seeing correctly? And then the Holy Spirit said, read it again now. Read it again. And I read again. And I noticed that Jesus began this statement by saying, verily, verily. Verily, verily. That's to say, there's no mincing the words. There's no mincing of words. I am speaking exactly what I am saying. I mean what I mean, what I say, and I say what I mean. Everyone who believes in me, the works that I do, shall he do. And I ask, I, I tell myself, what have we even done? If we look at all that Jesus has done, we have not even done 1,000 one of what he did. And I, I, I got challenged. And I, I, from that day, I began to tell myself, I began to tell myself that, look, you have a long journey to go. So you cannot afford to just play like a Jessica and just live your life anyhow. And of course, that, those are part of the scripture that God used to, you know, to ginger me in those days when I was coming up in the faith. And I realized that if Jesus said this, then it is possible in the life of every believer. And I began to ask questions, what is really wrong? Why, why is it that we have not even seen all the greatest, the biggest men of God that we have seen? I mean, all that they have done, they have not even, they have tried as well, those who have raised their, have raised their, but... When you look into their lives, you see that there's great anointing, but something is missing. Great anointing, but something is missing. Great anointing, character flaws. Great anointing, great flaws. Great anointings, great disappointments. And I began to ask the question, Lord, what is it that we must get, we must understand, to be able to do what you have said about us. And that's taking me a long time. But I want to share a little bit, I, I, I want to share a little bit of what I have seen with you this morning. And so please, open your heart, open your spirit, and let's look at the scriptures together. Let's consider that very carefully. Now, go back to that John 1. Let's go back to that John chapter 1. Let's go back. Let's go back to that statement again. Go back to that verse 50 and 51 again. Now, Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto you, I saw you under the fig tree. Believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than this. And he said unto him, and Now, what are the great... Now, he now, he now began to give him the key. He began to give him the key. A suggestion of how these greater things are going to come. So, if we are going to see greater things than what we have seen, then we need to pay attention to the, that last next statement in verse 51. He, and he said unto him, verily, verily, look at that word again, for sure. I'm saying to you that after this time out, thereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God descending and ascending upon the Son of Man. Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, where he, I mean, that's part of his humility. He, he always emptied himself. He was, was by now the son of God. By now, Jesus, Jesus was not what we know before Jordan. Something happened to him. And what was that uh, that happened to him? That, that brought him to this level to be able to make this confident, confident uh, statement, this confident declaration. 
that greater things are going to happen. And he, he alluded the reason for, for his, for his uh, declaration. Jesus was saying, greater things are going to come than this for this reason. That heaven will be open and angels will begin to ascend and descend. You need to understand that there must be an experience, an experience in your life, my life, that must usher us into this declaration of Jesus. It is true that uh, every believer, even before we give our life to Christ, we all have guardian angels. I don't know whether you know. Maybe you don't know. It was not the day you gave your life to Christ that God had already known you. Before the foundation of the world, your name has been written in the volume of the book. Your name has been written in the Lamb's book of life. If you go to Revelation chapter 13 and Revelation chapter uh, is it 17, I think in verse 9, uh, verse 9 of each, of each chapter, you will see there, he said, he said, let me paraphrase, that the Antichrist will, des will deceive many because their names were not written from the foundation of the world in the Lamb's book of life. So if their names were not written, that means also the names of those who were written in the Lamb's book of life is also there. And if you want to know where that is recorded, you go, just go to uh, the book of Revelation chapter 21, and you, uh, chapter 22, and you discover that it's only those, only those who will have a place in the temple, in God's temple, when it comes to become manifest on the face of the earth, are those whose names have been written in the Lamb's book of, li Lamb's book of life. So you, 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 di you did not give, just give your, you, how do I put it? You did not, you did, it's not that, that it is the day you gave your life to God, your name is just being written. It's a wrong prayer. Those who pray, write my name in the book of life. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, one of those rhetorical prayers that we, we normally pray. You know, I normally tell you that there are many prayers we pray that is out of, out of place. There is just, a, it's just a, Ignorance is a show of ignorance and the, a, 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 a verbosity. Pardon my, pardon my English. I don't have another word. Verbosity is emptiness. When you are repeating and repeating for no sake. I, I, I will understand what I'm saying. Your name was written from the foundation of the world. It's only those who offend, like you told Moses. Only those who offend him that will have their name blotted out. Not that you were, the, the, that's why, you see, this is what I call we make sometimes, you know. <laughs> and we tell them we are born again. <laughs> sometimes, I, I, with, the knowledge, with the understanding I have now, I just look at it, I smile. If somebody is genuinely a, 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 a candidate of heaven, a candidate of the kingdom, you don't need to follow him up too much. You don't need. It's only those who are not, they, those, who, those who just, out of emotion, they come out and they know that you have to struggle and to get them established. No. If, if he's a candidate of, of the kingdom, you don't need too much follow-up. He will follow himself up. How, how many people followed me up? Anyway, let's not go to that. That's, the point I'm trying to make, let you see here is that if you are going to experience greater things, heaven must open over your life. The, the activity of heaven. There must be heavenly activity. That's how I define descending and ascending. Angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man simply means heaven is kissing the earth. There's an act, heavenly activity that is channeled through a, 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 a personality on the face of the earth. If we're going to see that greater thing, then the heavenly activity that requires the going up and down of angels must become a part of our life. And I want to say this, that that doesn't, doesn't happen anyhow. It doesn't happen instantly. I was saying something, I said, we all have a guardian angel. Yes. Before, before you, even before you came to know the Lord, an angel has been assigned to you. So, don't be surprised that you grew up, you didn't die before your time. Don't be surprised that you grew up, you are, not, you are not maimed. You are not maimed. You are not, you are not, uh, you are not, you are not messed up.
by the devil. Because left to the devil, he wants to, he will have loved to kill you from before you get, you get, you, I mean, you, you became one year old. Like he killed, uh, killed all the children of uh, uh, Israel in those days. He would have, if you knew that, <laughs> if you knew that you were a candidate of the kingdom, and of course there's a way he can, he can sometimes he, he gets to know some things. He would have killed you, left, left, to, left to him, he would have killed you a long time. But he could not, because God had been watching your life. From the womb to the tomb, God is your God. He's been there. God has always been there. You only need to look back, cast your mind back, and look at your life before you give your life to Christ. You will see the finger of God. You will see how God moved in your life. You will see what he did in the past, even when you do not know him. Hallelujah. So now, when Jesus began to say here that you will begin to see heaven open and the angels ascend and descend upon the Son of Man, what he's simply saying here is that you must, you, you, in my own life, in my own life, in my own life, I have gotten an encounter. I have had an encounter. And what is that encounter? Just go back again. I, 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 want, I was making a reference to God. I think we should read it. Look at this. Look at verse 32. <laughs> it's in verse 32. And John bear record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove. And it abode upon him. I saw the spirit descending like a dove. That's the experience that Matthew and Luke recorded. When Luke was recording this account, he said the, 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 the Holy Spirit descended in a bodily form. Bodily form, not as dove. Not as a dove. The, light, the similarity that the Holy Spirit made here about the dove, on the, about the descent of the, of the spirit, is to help you to, to, show, to just show that the descent is a gentle descent. It's not that the, the, what was descending is a dove. What was descending is not a dove. What was descending is a Godhead bodily. And so that Godhead endured Jesus and gave him the empowerment, the enablement, to say and to declare these things that you read in chapter 50 and 51. Like I've always said this, and I will not cease to say it. If you compare what happened to Jesus at Jordan with what happened in the day of Pentecost, there are two different experiences. They are not alike. They are not the same. Jesus had already been baptized with the Holy Spirit. He had the Holy Spirit from, the, from birth. Just like John. He had the Spirit from uh, the Holy Spirit. But what came on Jesus is a descent of the Spirit nature. Is a, a person of God, the God that coming upon him, transforming him, quickening him, lifting him above the earth to the throne of God where he can have access to all the heavenly resources. I don't know whether you understand what I'm saying. Let me, let me come back. Let me come along this direction. What happened there is not, is, not, is not what happened on Pentecost. This is not Pentecost experience. What happened on Pentecost experience is the Holy Spirit coming like a rushing mighty wind. A rushing mighty wind. And the Bible said it sat upon them like cloven tongues. And the, the scripture said they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak with other tongues. And you discover that from time to time, if you read in other chapters, what happened to the uh, apostles, as at that time, was a temporal feeling. They needed to be refilled again. And so that's, that's why you read in Acts chapter, uh, is it chapter uh, 15? And then, no, it's Acts chapter, it should be Acts chapter 7 or so. No, 6. Acts chapter 6. And then Acts chapter uh, 9, is it 19 now? You read again that they were filled again. So, that one time experience was just uh, uh, a, 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 temporary, uh, a temporary experience to lead them to more experience of the feel, infilling. But what happened to Jesus was a permanent abode. I'm trying to help you see the difference. What came on Jesus is a spirit nature, not the spirit uh, unction. I don't know whether you understand what I'm saying. 
The spirit nature is different from the spirit unction. The unction of the Holy Spirit, when it comes upon you, it empowers you to do some things. But it does not change you totally. It doesn't change you. That's why you can be so anointed, massively anointed like Samson, and you see uh, temptation, you fall for temptations. You can be massively anointed, okay, like Samson, and still go on your own way. You can be massively anointed, do great works, do, do great things, yet the enemy can still find a way out to overcome. But he that is born of God, truly born of God, by the Spirit of God coming upon his life, cannot sin. He cannot. So what came on Jesus here is a spirit nature. There's a spirit nature called the Godhead that must come upon everyone. When the spirit nature comes upon a man, he brings an end to the flesh. Because what limits a man is the flesh. Every limitation of a man is the flesh. Every limitation of a man is the flesh. So when the spirit nature comes, it silences like the silencer. He stops the noise of the flesh. He stops the workings of the flesh. He stops all the, all the noise making of the flesh. He stops all the, the limitations of the flesh. Drives it aground. And causes the, the, the true nature of God to be, to be displayed. And it opens the man, lifts the man beyond the, beyond the level of the earthly to the level of the heavenly. How do I know? Go with me to John chapter 3. Go to John chapter 3. Look at what Jesus said here. Jesus said something here to Nicodemus that I don't know whether you have paid attention to. I don't know whether you paid attention to this before now. Jesus was speaking and he was telling Nicodemus, he said, you are a teacher of Israel and you don't know these things. Aha, uh -huh, look at this. I'm trying to get it verse. Uh, just give me a minute. I need to get that verse. I wasn't preparing for this, but I, I need to read this to let to see, show you that there's a difference. Okay, maybe let me be, let me. I want to get that very fast so that I won't waste the time. Okay, let me let me start reading so that to save time. Look at what Jesus began to say. He said, "Very verily I say unto thee, we speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, you believe, and you believe it not. How shall you believe if I tell you?" Of heavenly things. And no man, uh -huh, that's verse 13 now. Look at verse 13. And no man hath ascended up to heaven. But he that came down from where? From heaven. Even the Son of Man, who is where? Who is where? Help me complete it. But where was Jesus? Who was Jesus talking to? He was talking to Nicodemus. And he was talking about heavenly things. And he was surprised that a man who was supposed to be a religious man, full of knowledge and understanding, could not comp com comprehend what he was saying. And he said, if I've told you heavenly things, uh, uh, things and you, how much if we now begin to talk about heavenly things? And then he now said in verse 13, and said, no man has ascended into heaven. Now, let me tell you this. When the Spirit of God came upon Jesus, these were the things that happened to Jesus. Jesus was transfigured. His body was no longer the same flesh and blood that you used to see. He was no longer Jesus. He became Christ. The glory of God came upon him. It was the glory of God that came upon him, lightened upon him. 
changed his, changed his entire being. And lifted him up. Lifted him high above all principalities, above all powers. Placed him on the throne. So he had access to all things. There was nothing that was limited, that was not committed to his hand. Everything the father had, every revelation. That was why he was able to say in John 5, verse 19 and 20, that, see, what my father do, I, I, I do. Why? Because at that point, at that level, at that location, he could see all things. There was nothing limited. There was nothing that Jesus could, could not know. There was nothing he wanted to know that he, was, he, wouldn't, he, wouldn't, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't be shown. He was shown all things. He knew all things. So he was able to see all things. So when he said to, uh, to Nathaniel, I saw you, it was because Jesus was lifted above the earth, even though it was physical. In the realm of the spirit, he could see the ends of the earth. He could see the ends of the earth. He could see beyond the present. He could see. He was lifted up. Set above the earth. Placed in the heavenly realm. So that was why he said, and I'll read it again, and no man has, has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Hallelujah. Now let me tell you this. Go to Isaiah. You see, when you have the Holy Spirit released upon your life, the Holy Spirit is released for you to lift you gradually. That's why Isaiah said something, and I want, to read, I want you to see that every time a new unction comes upon you, the Holy Spirit comes upon you, it lifts you spiritually. You go higher. You go higher, higher, higher. You are no longer on the pedestal, on the earthly terrestrial pedestal. You are no longer on this earthly plane. You have shifted higher and higher and higher and higher. And there's a journey that we are all taking. We are all ascending. I always liken salvation to, or we can liken salvation to a man climbing a hill. Climbing a hill to be seated and to tabernacle with God on the mountain. And so you read in so many places of the scripture, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Or who shall dwell in his tabernacle? And Isaiah says something that I want you to pay attention to. Let's go to Isaiah 3. Look at Isaiah 3. I want to show you something. I'm still building up. I'm building up. I'm, I want you to see that, you see, when you're, there's an outpour of the Spirit upon your life, it is lifting you up and up and up and up. You're going higher and higher and higher. And that, wherever you are now, is not the ultimate. What, ev what each one of us should be seeking for is the fullness of the measure of the Spirit. What we should be looking for is what Jesus had an encounter of, about. He, 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 he had that encounter at Jordan. He had a spirit poured, released upon his life, gave him that, that, that uh, uh, lifting to that height of, of glory that no man has, has ascended. So he ascended to that height and he was able to take control and take charge. And he was able to declare what he, he declared, that there will be greater things. And I, I, I see from here that also, if we also begin to understand that what, why we, why, what we are looking for, the, what we should be looking for, as we receive more and more of the Spirit of God, the anointings of God is not what is the ultimate. What is the ultimate is the spirit nature, having the glory of God, lighting upon us, opening the heavens upon us, and lifting us onto that height where we can see as we should see and hear as we should hear. Look at what Isaiah said. Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 33. Look at beginning from verse 19. Let me start from verse 19. Okay, okay. Maybe you should back up a bit. Uh -huh. Before you get to that, maybe let's back up a bit. Look at what, look at what Isaiah said. He said, the sinners in Zion, let me pick some verses in verse 14 and 15. He said, the sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? He that worketh righteously. Underline that. That's the number one thing. 
That's number one, your walk. Your walk with God. And speak it uprightly. He that despises the gain of oppressions, that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, that stopped his ears from hearing of blood, and shut his eyes from seeing evil. Verse 16, Isaiah 3. He shall do what? Dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given him. His water shall be sure. And then it says, His eyes shall see what? The king in his beauty. They shall behold a land that is very afar off. That heart shall meditate terror. Where then is the scribe? Where is the receiver? Where is he that counted the towers? What is the scripture saying? What is the scripture saying is that, let me, para- let me paraphrase it for you. It's simply saying that if you want to be lifted to a dimension of glory, an height of dwelling place where you can do great things, where you can see things and hear things, you know what is limiting us? Like I said, is the flesh. What is limiting us is the flesh. If, if angels were ascending and descending here now, nobody would see it. Except their eyes are opened. Angels are spirit beings. You can't see them. But if you have your eyes open, there are people in whose ministry that I know. When they are ministering like this, they'll be telling you some things. They'll tell you, get ready. Get ready. Something's about to happen to you now. It's because they are seeing angels at work and they will tell you exactly what they're going to do. So now, the point I'm trying to bring up here is this. Is this. Now, hear me very well. Hear me clearly. Until you get to a point, a walk, there is a walk with you. Until you walk to a point with God, some things don't break loose. Now, let me, let me before I even finish up in this uh, uh, verse of this scripture, do, let, the, the story of Elijah and Elisha, let's, bring, let's look at it again. Look at Elijah, look at Elisha. Elijah had been operating a prophetic ministry before Elisha was called. Elisha began to pour water upon the hands of Elijah. And for how many years, we don't know. But there came a time when Elijah must be taken to heaven by a whirlwind, and he knew it. That shows a man who is a lot sensitive in the spirit, who knows that, hey, I'm here for a business. There's something I must get to. If I must, if I must do like, my, 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 like, my, like my, my, my master, if I must become like my master, I even do better than my master, who Jesus also spoke about, which you have read in John 14, 12, then I must, I must go for something. And so when the sons of the prophets came and telling, ah, do you know that uh, your, your master is going to be taken from off your head today? He said, oh, I know, hold your peace. So they went from Bethel to Gilgal, from Gilgal, yeah, from Gilgal to Jericho, and then from Jericho to Jordan. Now, while they were transporting themselves between those locations, there was no interaction as such. But the life of Elijah was changing. The life of Elijah was changing. The life of Elijah was changing. But, but that was not the ultimate. Until they crossed the Jordan. And when they crossed the Jordan, the Bible said, Elijah asked him, why is it that after they crossed Jordan, that Elijah asked him? That's to tell you that a spiritual principle is being revealed to us in, the, in, that, in that small story. And what is the principle? The principle is that you must walk with him. You must walk with your, the Holy Spirit. I see Elijah as the Holy Spirit. If you walk with the Holy Spirit to a point, to a point, remember also in Ezekiel chapter 47, he said, after 1,000 cubits, the water came to the ankle. After another 1,000 cubits, to the, to the knee. Another 1,000 to, uh, to the waist. And then after another 1,000, a river. What we should desire is not just the, the, the water, the, 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 the little water that reaches to the, to the knee or to the ankle or whatever waist. But what we should look, be looking for is the fullness of the glory and the capacity of God. So it was after he got over, came over they came over Jordan, that Elijah asked him, what will you have me to do for you? And he said that they may have double portion of your spirit nature. Not the anointing, no. Many people, when they read that scripture, they think, uh, they think it's uh, what Elijah was asking for is the anointing. Uh, Elijah wasn't asking for anointing. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. He was asking for the spirit nature. The, the, the mantu. It was the mantu. The mantu 
signifies Christ. The mantle talks about Christ. I mean, it's a, it's a picture of Christ, which any man will put on will be able to do what Jesus had done and even greater works than that. So what happened? When, he got, when, when, when the time came as they were talking and talking, you know, Elijah, Elijah began to discuss with Elisha, uh, and they said, look, oh, the condition for which you're going to get it is that uh, you, you see me when I'm taken. And you know, when a whirlwind, do, have you ever seen a whirlwind? See one wind, about three jibang, two bang, fair, kilomanshele. I tell you to man, be a rich, rich, dirty. Dirt, so many things that you can be easily distracted. But you know what? <laughs> Elijah was in main business. And he knew, he knew, he made up his mind. Uh -uh. No matter what, I will, get, I will see you. So when, when we came, and the chariots of fire and horses came, took Elijah up, he cried out, Father, my father, my father. The chariots of Israel. And then the mantle fell instantly. And he took that mantle. And with that mantle, he, put, he destroyed his own mantle. He tore his own mantle. Which is to show you that it's, it's something you are carrying now that you see have to be destroyed. The mantle there is the flesh. It's the flesh. He takes the mother mantle. You, you, until you have the, the, the mantle from, that falls from above, that the, this, this earthly mantle can, can, be, can be dissolved. That's why Paul continues to say, he said, while we're in this one, we're grown. That is our earthly tabernacle. If it be dissolved, we have a better building of God in the heavenlies. So if this one be destroyed, we have another one to replace it. <laughs> so he got a hold of the mantle, and you know what happened? He went back to the Jordan, struck it, and said, where is the God of Elijah? I wish you had said, where is the God of Elijah? Now, because <laughs> the God of Elijah, Elijah has finished his own time. Oh. It is now the time of Elisha. It's the time of, Eli the time of Elisha has come. I, 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 I wish you had said, let the God of Elisha show up. And of course, you know, sometimes when we make some mistakes, it's like uh, when uh, uh, Joshua too was commanding, he said, he said, let his son stand still. That was, that was, the sun was already standing still. It was the earth that was actually moving. Abina. But God understood what he was saying. <laughs> God understood what he was saying. So, but at that point in time, every word of Elisha became a law. There was nothing heaven can do but to obey and to, and of course, the ministry of the angels began to attend. Do you think, do you think uh, it was ordinary that uh, the waters of Jordan parted at that time? That was an heavenly activity. That was beyond the realm of man. So we saw Elijah mounting up. And we saw how great things God accomplished through his life. Now, the point I'm trying to get across to you is that angels, the ministry of angels don't show up in the dimension that uh, we read about Jesus, that we read about Elijah and Elijah until they, they're crossing over, to, uh, uh, over Jordan. Another example, let me give you another example. Jacob. Jacob also had an experience in Manai. Genesis chapter 40 to 32. Genesis 32. If you read here again, we, we, we see uh, Jacob, verse 1. The Bible said, and Jacob went on his way. And the angels of God, not one, not two, the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw, saw them, he said, this is God's host. And he called the name of that place Mahanim. Now, at Manahim, God decided. Now, that Manahim, which that place where he called Manahim, was after the Jordan. How do I know? When he began to pray, now he was afraid, so afraid of his, of his brother. Because he knew what his brother could do. And he had what his brother was coming with. He had that his brother was coming with 400 soldiers, harmed, fully harmed. So, when he came, when he was on the way, he started doing something. He, he, he divided his, his, his family into two bands. And then he, he began to pray. And then li listen to what he prayed. The first statement he uttered. He said, I'm, I'm not worthy of the list of all the mercies and of all the truths which 
thou hast shown me. For with my staff, I passed over this Jordan. And now I am become two bands. Look at that. He said, when I was going to Padanara, I had only my staff with me. He had nothing. But now, God had multiplied him in the fulfillment of his promise. Now, when he was now coming back, now, he, he, was, he had now divided his family into two. Now, when he was making reference to the two bands, you begin to wonder, does Jacob realize that when he was talking about two bands, he was not, the two bands is not just a physical two. It was a physical one and a spiritual one. Making two. You don't, you, don't get, you don't get what I'm saying. By this time, God had already programmed Jacob to have the ministry of angels. The bands. The two. It, wasn't by, it, was, it wasn't by joke that he had that experience. Do you, why do you think uh, the angels met him at Manahim? The angels met him at Manahim to, to usher him into a new experience and dimension of the greater things that God will have to do in his life. By this time, of course, thank God for all that God had done. God had blessed him, given him uh, uh, wives, even though it was, that was not the plan of God. God wanted him to have just one wife, like you have had. But, you know, events, he was, he was also conned. He was tricked into all those, all, those, all those things. And eventually, he had so large a family. And by the time he was living, he had been so blessed with so much of cattle and all that. But Jacob did, not, Jacob did not realize that beyond physical blessing, beyond physical substances, there was something greater. That God will have him to do. And what is it that God will have him to do that is greater? God will have him to go back to that land of promise, get himself established, get a foothold upon the land of promise, and dwell there. That was the greater work that God was actually having in mind and beyond for him to, to experience. So he did not consider that he was not just alone again. He was thinking in terms of the two bands with, to which he separated his family. You know, he, he, he put the three wives in the first band. Then the second band was himself and the, uh, Rachel and, the, you know, in the second band. But in actual fact, there were two bands which comprised his entire family also, which would have remained one. And then the band of angels. Hello, somebody. Hello, somebody. Hello. God had already made Jacob two bands. But he didn't realize it. He didn't realize it. And that was because Jacob still also needed another encounter. And what is what the encounter that was to be commensurate with, with what, he, uh, what, what, what God had given him? He was supposed to be transformed. So at that night, during that night, a man came to wrestle with him. The man wrestled with him. And then overnight, he wouldn't let go. He was still struggling until the whole of his thigh was, was, was touched. And when the whole of his thigh was touched, he, he, he had to surrender. And then the angel asked him, what is your name? And he said, I'm Jacob. He said, no longer will your name be Jacob, but now it shall be called Israel. For everyone that will experience two bands, it is a necessity that there must be a change of nature. There must be a change of nature. For everyone that must experience, I'm saying it again, that will have the two bands, the band on earth and the band from heaven. In any, in any person's life, any believer's life, in whose life the heavens must open, angels must ascend and descend, then there must be a change of nature. Anointing does not change a man. Anointing does not change a man. I'm repeating again. Anointing does not change a man. What changes a man is the glory of God. No wonder Paul said, he said, as we behold him in a glass, we're changed from one degree of glory to another. Okay, we're changed from, from I mean, to the same image, from glory to glory. From glory to glory. So what is changing us is the glory. We're changed from one degree of glory to another. And we're changed into that same image. What changes us is that glory. Is the glory. As we behold that glory. As we see, look into the mirror. As we take time. As we take time. Now, that daily walk. That daily walk in the world. That daily walk 
in fellowship with God. If it is not intact, if you don't maintain it, sorry, you're not ready for an open heaven. The open heaven that we're enjoying now is the one that, was, that has been open to, gener to the generality of all, all who come. And that was open because to give us access to the throne of grace. But what about the access to all other things? I wrote down here, I said, I said, anyone who's going to experience the greater dimension of the things that Jesus is talking about must have, two, two things must be established. One, he must have an open heaven as a result of a changed nature. There must be an open heaven as a result of a changed nature. When there's an open heaven, that means access is given to that individual beyond the throne of grace. You are given access to revelation. You are given access to resources in heaven. Do you know that there are resources in heaven that we need to use on the face of the earth? These chariots of horses, can you imagine if you were the one that has the access to these chariots, chariots of horses? You remember in the life of ministry of Elisha, when the Syrian, the Syrian king sent a, a band of soldiers to go and arrest him and, and bring him. After they discovered he was always leaking their secrets. He was always knowing where they were planning to attack. And he was divulging all their secrets. You know, they, they arranged and then they went. Somebody gave them, gave them information that, ah, there's one man of God. <laughs> if you don't, kill, don't arrest him and kill him, you will continue to suffer defeat. So they went after him. And then Gehazi looked around and said, ah, Otonleni. Aye watita. Like he was saying. Aye. <laughs> Probably saying that. And then the man of God saw that this man was so afraid. And then he prayed, Lord, open his eyes to see. And when he saw, when he looked, he saw that the whole mountain, a whole mountain, he saw a mountain. And the mountain was, was full of chariots of horses surrounding the man of God. Surrounding the man of God. <laughs> I said... <laughs> This kind of ministry, we, are, we need it to, in these days so, to deal with all these uh, Boko Harams and all these, uh, all these uh, uh, whatever they call them. Can you imagine? You are, you are surrounded by chariots. In fact, one angel is even enough. One fighter angel is enough to finish one, 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 million, one million soldiers. One, one, one angel alone. So, there are resources that we are yet to see. There are resources in heaven that we need to, we need to use. There are information from above that we need to have. So, the question is, where is the scribe? Where is the one? Where is the, where is the, where is the receiver? Where is the scribe? Who is he that has, has been lifted and is dwelling in the munitions of rock, far above, above principalities? Who has access to this information and can actually, you know, draw down all these resources to accomplish great things on the face of the earth. God intended, God intended that we should, we should have access to all these resources. There's no man who can live in the, in the dominion on the face of the earth, especially the days we are in now. There's no man who can actually do greater things without having this access. If we're going to have that greater thing coming to, to, to pass, being battered for in the face of the earth, then we must have access, unlimited access, like Jesus had. And not only that, our love for God must be in place. The reason Jesus, second reason Jesus gave why great things will begin to happen, greater things will happen, is that the love of the Father does not diminish. And the reason the love of the Father does not diminish is because the Father loved the Son, and the Son loved the Father. And therefore, the Father showed it in greater works. So, obedience to the will of God Walking in his counsel, doing only those things that pleases him, will earn us these greater things. Let me round up by so saying. So I want to challenge you. I don't know what you are looking for. I don't know what you are hoping to, to get. If you are think, talking about greater things, to me, greater things simply means having access, having access to what an ordinary man cannot have, having access to a man who is not, li who is not dwelling on the face of the earth can have, Having access to what is, what, is, what is hidden and what is only limited for those who actually pursue after God. Elisha, they know, they know, you know, he knew what he was after. He knew what he was pursuing. He knew there was something better 
greater than what he has seen, even in the ministry of his, of his uh, master. So he did not waste time. He continued. He pressed on until he was able to get it. So I want to encourage you today, don't rest on your hoa where you are. There's something better and greater than what you have witnessed so far. Shall we go to prayer? Thank you.